Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. We spent some time in class looking at different types of boundaries, but tonight we'll be changing the scale and looking internally at how states organize their space. States are divided internally into territorial subdivisions that are called different terms depending on the state. Some call them regions, provinces, districts, states, prefectures, cantons, or any number of names. So let's start with how the central government interacts with those subnational units. The division of power between the central government and its subnational units varies among countries and is influenced by whether the state has a unitary or federal system. Both systems administer the day-to-day -day operations of governing with sovereignty, and the national government is the final authority. But in a unitary system, the state has a centralized government and administration that exercises power equally over all parts of the state. That means that the centralized government has most of the power. And I know this isn't a great definition because it doesn't necessarily lend itself to a lot of the details. Basically, here's what you need to know for a unitary system. The central government, or national government in this visual, holds all the power. The subnational units don't really get much power. In a federal system, though, a central government represents the various subnational entities within a state where they have common interests, defense, foreign affairs, and the like, yet allows these subnational entities to retain their own identity and to have their own laws, policies, and customs in certain spheres. The key here is to look at the relationship between the central government and the subunits when it comes to decision-making and power. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Let's start with federal states. The authority of the government is shared between the central government or national or federal government, they go by different names, and the subnational units, including state or provincial government. Then you may also have local governments like counties or cities that have certain powers as well. Regardless of the specifics of the country, federal systems are set up so that power is diffused throughout multiple levels of government. And we tend to see federal systems in countries with multiple ethnic groups that constitute a significant minority. This allows distinct cultural groups to make decisions that best suit that group. For example, federalism remains vital in Canada to counteract French-Canadian demands for Quebec's independence. By emphasizing federalism, the central government allows more latitude for provincial self-rule, thus reducing support for secession. Canada has also extended considerable self-rule privileges to the Inuit and Native American groups of the North. However, it doesn't always work out that way, as multinational states like the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia all fell apart despite their federalist systems, and the future of Belgium and Iraq as single states is in some doubt. Federalism is also a good way to manage large countries as well. Seven of the eight largest countries by land area, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, India, Russia, and the United States are all organized as federal states. Only China continues as a unitary state. And Russia is a good example because it has adopted a more federalist structure to accommodate the demands of ethnic minorities as well as manage its huge land area. 31 ethnic republics within Russia have achieved considerable autonomy. And it should be noted that though one of these, Chechnya, 
has been fighting for independence from Russia. So now, let's look at the United States. The central government, which we often call the federal government, handles the coining of money and the raising of military forces, among other areas, all of which are issues that affect the entire country. But the U.S. Constitution reserves to the states all those powers that aren't specifically given to the federal government, which has given the states a great deal of sovereignty over a number of aspects of decision making. And so this has led to very diverse legal decisions that can actually reveal the processes of cultural diffusion at work. A good example is the clean air movement, which began in California with the initiation of state legislation regulating automotive and industrial emissions. It then spread to other states and has actually become the model for clean air legislation at the national level, kind of a reverse hierarchical diffusion. The big picture here is that a federal system, in that federal system, multiple subnational units have local control, but are unified by the central government to pursue common goals at the national level. By distributing power, a federalist government reduces core periphery tensions by allowing subnational units a great deal of latitude in passing and enforcing laws and regulations. But let's look at another example. In Nigeria, the 36 states choose their own judicial system. In the northern part of the country, 12 states, which are predominantly Muslim, have adopted Sharia laws. Sharia is Islamic law, which is detailed in the Quran and has been applied for a long time in personal and civil law in northern Nigeria. But in recent years, all of the states of northern Nigeria added criminal law to the jurisdiction of Sharia courts. And Sharia law in the northern states of Nigeria is only applied to Muslims, not to Christians or animists living there. So non-Muslims are not tried in Sharia courts, but they have complained that their political and economic marginalization has increased since the change. And some Northerners seek to expand Sharia law to other states in the country. And that idea is a motivating force for the Islamic fundamentalist group Boko Haram in an attempt to overthrow the existing government and bring into being an Islamic state in Nigeria. And this is just one example of how individual federalist governments can operate. So now let's look at unitary states. The governmental authority is held primarily by the central government with very little or no power given to local governments. And thus there is no hierarchy of power. It's all held at the central government. Provincial and local governments are often simply extensions of the national government. Take France, for example. The French government divided the state into more than 90 départements, or departments. But representatives come to Paris not just to express regional concerns, but to implement central government decisions back at home. And it should be noted that until the end of World War II, many European states were highly centralized, with the capital city serving as the focus of power, thereby concentrating authority with the central government. And that concentration of power can be undemocratic, like we see in China and Saudi Arabia, or it can be fairly democratic, like we see in the United Kingdom and Indonesia. So let's talk a little bit more about the United Kingdom. In 1997, both Scotland and Wales were empowered to determine much of their own internal affairs. Kind of atypical for a unitary state. So while the UK is ostensibly a unitary state, in reality, several of its component parts, Scotland, Wales, have a degree of autonomy far surpassing that of many federal states. But here's the difference. These rights are not 
constitutionally enshrined and can be taken back by the central government at any time. Which makes sense because the UK is a multinational state with multiple nationalities, which sounds more like a federal state. And unitary governments work particularly well in countries with few cultural differences and relatively small minority groups. So here are two maps that look at federal states in the top left in green and unitary states in the bottom right in blue. And remember that while it looks like countries are neatly divided into one of two categories, as with most things in this class, it's a spectrum. Think about the UK. It is technically a unitary state, but with a lot of the trappings of federal systems. So we have to ask questions like, how much authority does the central government have? How much authority do subnational units have? So quickly, in your notes, what do you notice? What do you see? What patterns do you observe? What questions do you have? So let's try a quick little test. Which country is federal? Which country is unitary? Well, Germany is federal and Japan is unitary. But how can we figure that out without just memorizing every country? Well, they show you the subnational units for Germany and not for Japan. But maybe you're wondering, does Japan actually have subnational units? Yes, they do. They're called prefectures. But so does Germany. So here's a little hint. If they show you a map with subnational units and ask if it's unitary or federal, chances are, if they're showing you the subnational units, it's federal. And in both unitary and federal states, the central government is often housed in the capital, which is a town or city that is the official seat of government in a political entity such as a state or nation. But capital cities vary in their function and importance around the world. In many cases, the capital is located in a territory completely independent of any other subunit. We see this with Washington, D.C., where D.C. stands for District of Columbia. It's separate from the states of Maryland and Virginia that surround it here in the United States, as well as the Australian Capital Territory, or ACT, in Australia. Washington, D.C. is also an example of a compromise capital. It was situated between the North and the South, that had different interests in how the country was going to be run. And we can see the same thing in Ottawa, the capital of Canada, which is situated between the French-speaking territory of Quebec and the rest of the English-speaking country. In Mexico, for example, Mexico City serves as both the political center of the country as well as the clear center of the country's population economy, and cultural life. Bolivia contains two capitals. La Paz is the administrative and legislative capital, and Sucre is where the judicial branch is seated. South Africa also has multiple capitals, three capitals, in fact. Johannesburg is the administrative capital, Cape Town houses the legislature, and Bloemfontein is the judicial seat. Capitals may also be chosen from the historic center of the country, as is the case with Rome and Italy. In many former colonies, the current capital city emerged from the colonial capital. In Indonesia, the colonial capital of the Dutch East Indies was Batavia, which has since been renamed Jakarta, which remains the capital city, at least for now. The country is planning to move the capital as the city of Jakarta literally sinks into the Java Sea. Speaking of moving capitals, some capitals are intended to help encourage people to move toward less populous areas. 
We call these forward thrust capitals, sometimes just forward capitals. Brazil moved its capital from the colonial capital of Rio de Janeiro on the coast to Brasilia to try and draw people to the interior. We can see this in other former colonies as well, in countries like Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Nigeria, Myanmar, as well as Pakistan. Other capitals may be established in the most central area of the country, such as the case when Turkey chose its capital of Ankara instead of the more important and populous city of Istanbul. Continuing to change the scale of governance, now we look at the local level, at entities such as counties, municipalities, school districts, regional planning commissions, and things like that. Because the United States has a federal system, there are often overlapping levels of government. So, for example, the government of the city of Las Vegas enjoys certain authority, but other powers are delegated to the Clark County commissioners who head up the government of Clark County. And both of these are superseded by the authority enjoyed by Nevada's state government, which in turn is superseded by the sovereignty exercised by the federal government of the United States. Just to give you some numbers, in the United States, there is one federal central government, over 50 state commonwealth and territorial governments, and over 87,000 local governments. And that 87,000 includes roughly 3,000 counties, 20,000 cities, 16,000 townships, 13,000 school districts, and 35,000 special purpose districts, such as regional planning commissions and police districts. To see what this is like in reality, in 2013, Illinois had 6,963 units of government. That's almost 7,000 decision-making entities in one state. A typical resident lived with six or more layers of local government. So what are all these units of government doing? Well, different tasks depending on the level. U.S. state governments provide for transportation, welfare, public higher education, and many aspects of environmental protection, as well as prison services. City and local governments provide safety functions such as fire and police, infrastructure such as water systems, support systems, power plants, traffic control, as well as some road construction and maintenance, and then educational functions, including the establishment and maintenance of public schools. And this division is done for a number of reasons. Basic efficiency, allowing government agents to respond more quickly, as well as greater flexibility, allowing for different approaches to governance based on the community in which it is centered. So now let's shift to another way that space is organized politically, and that is for elections. Electoral geography examines how people's political preferences are manifested in representation. So let's start with the different types of representation. In places like Europe, they use a proportional representation system, meaning that multiple representatives can be elected. Voters choose from among political parties rather than individual candidates, and legislative seats are divided on a proportional basis. So, for example, if a party received 30% of the votes, they would receive 30% of the legislative seats. And we tend to see this in countries with many political parties. But in the United States, we have a majority plurality representation, meaning that the person who receives a majority over 50% or a plurality, meaning they have the most votes but didn't break 50%, the person that receives the most votes is elected. And this is called a single member district, meaning that the person who wins represents all of the voters in that electoral district. 
And we also see majority plurality systems in countries that have two dominant political parties. So let's talk further about the United States and its electoral system. We have a two-house legislative branch at the national level consisting of the Senate and the House of Representatives. In the Senate, every state gets two senators, regardless of their size. But the House of Representatives is based on population. So the bigger states have more representatives and the smaller states have fewer. In 1912, the number of representatives was capped at 435 and it stayed there ever since. These representatives are elected to districts that have similar sized populations. There are some states though, like Wyoming, Montana, and Alaska, that are so small in terms of population that they only have one representative that covers the entire state. So the district boundaries are the state's boundaries. And these are called at-large districts. But people move and populations shift. So how does the House of Representatives take that into account? Well, every 10 years we have a census which counts the population of every state throughout the entire country. Then we can compare which states grew in population and which states shrank. And this is largely a product of internal migration throughout the country. Then we undergo a process called reapportionment. This is the process by which districts are moved according to population shifts, so that each district encompasses approximately the same number of people across the entire country. Some states will gain districts and thus gain representation in the House, while others will lose districts and representatives. For example, the so-called Rust Belt, including Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan, lost representatives after the 2010 census, while Sun Belt states like Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida, along with southwestern states like Arizona, Nevada, and Utah, all gained representation. After reapportionment, when states gain or lose representation, individual states go through the process of redistricting. In redistricting, boundaries are drawn for congressional districts to reflect the population changes since the previous census. So that means that districts are redrawn every 10 years. And redistricting takes place at the state level with individual states responsible for drawing electoral district lines. And this is a great example of our federal system at work as each state gets to decide how and who gets to redraw those district lines. And here's where scale is so important. While these representatives will represent a local community, only a section of a state, they will vote on policies at the national level. And when states gain or lose representation, that affects the state as a whole. So scale is very important for understanding political geography. And when it comes to redistricting, equal representation is the most important. So each district must have approximately the same population. They also need to be compact, meaning they can't have any of these wild offshoots, and they must be contiguous or all in one piece. They can't be broken up. Finally, the courts have repeatedly called for representational equality for racial and linguistic minorities. But since each individual state gets to decide how to redraw, some methods of redistricting are biased. And this is known as gerrymandering or redistricting for advantage. It's the practice of dividing areas into electoral districts to give one political party an electoral majority in a large number of districts while concentrating the voting strength of this op the opposition into as few districts as possible. Gerrymandering has impacted the national scale to influence congressional districts, which typically receives the most attention, but it also stretches down to the local scale, influencing city council districts which may actually have a greater impact on individual people's day-to-day -day lives. 
And you may be wondering where this bizarre name came from, gerrymandering. And it has an equally bizarre story behind it. In 1812, the governor of Massachusetts, Elbridge Gerry, drew con congressional district lines that would benefit his political party, which was known as the Democratic Republicans at the time. One district looked so odd to artist Gilbert Stewart that he drew it with head, wings, and claws. And Stewart called it the Salamander District. But a colleague immortalized it by giving it the name Gary Mander, after Governor Elbridge Gary, which we then proceeded to mispronounce to the point that we now call it gerrymandering. So strange shapes have come to define gerrymandering. And when we look at the most gerrymandered district in the United States, it makes sense. This is North Carolina's 12th congressional district and is the most gerrymandered district in the United States right now. In fact, North Carolina has three out of the 10 most gerrymandered districts after the 2010 census. And gerrymandering is illegal. But just because an electoral district looks strange, even if it gives one group or political party an advantage, doesn't necessarily make it illegal. The Voting Rights Act prohibits lawmakers from drawing lines that dilute the influence of minority voters. And in 1982, the Voting Rights Act was amended and interpreted to mean that states needed to redistrict in a way that would ensure minority representation. So this led to the development of majority minority districts where a district is redrawn so that a majority of its population is from a minority group. So an odd-shaped district, like the 4th Congressional District in the Chicago area of Illinois, often called the Earmuff District, is drawn that way to preserve the influence of Latino voters. The district looks like earmuffs because Latino voters live in two pockets or enclaves separated by a largely African-American community. So the odd earmuff shape ensures that African-American voters don't dilute the influence of Latino voters and vice versa. So we have to look at, as the quote says there, whether there is a legitimate reason that they look like that. And that makes it a little bit tougher. So what about our local districts? According to the first of those two articles that I linked above, Nevada is one of the two least gerrymandered states. All right, go Nevada. So let's take a look at our districts. Notice District 1 is quite small, while Districts 2 and 4 are rather large. This illustrates the impact that population density and concentration can have on districts because District 1 is an urban area, that's Las Vegas, where population density and concentration are quite high and the rural areas of Districts 2 and 4 have much lower density and concentration. And this can be a challenge for representatives. Do you think people living in Old Henderson have the same concerns as those living in Anthem? How about the concerns out in Boulder City? What about Little Sandy Valley? All of those different communities are represented in Congressional District 3. People living in rural areas have different concerns and even values than people living in large urban or suburban areas. And a single representative may have to speak on all of their behalves. So how do politicians gerrymander? There are several ways. Let's start with the wasted vote, which disperses support for the opposition so that the opponent loses by a slim margin. This is also known as cracking. Then there is the excess vote, where a few districts contain a strong majority of the opposition, and the votes cast in these districts are well above what is needed to win the election. This is known as packing. Then you have stacking which links geographically distant areas to create a majority where one may not exist. This is where some of those very elongated congressional districts come in. But it can also create a majority-minority district, as we saw earlier. 
Then there are a few other strategies that don't get a lot of attention, but we'll mention them here. Due to longstanding tradition, representatives must live in the district that they represent. So a practice called hijacking would redraw two districts as one in order to force two elected representatives of the same party to run against each other. Another type of gerrymandering that deals with the residence of the elected representative is known as kidnapping. If you know where the representative lives and you're able to identify their base of support, then kidnapping would involve redrawing the lines from an area where they had support to an area where they don't have a lot of support. So let's use a visual to help us out. District 1 has been stacked by connecting a lot of blue that aren't geographically close to one another. District 2 has been packed. District 2 combines an overwhelming amount of red so that they'll easily win this district but aren't competitive in the other two districts. Finally, the reds in District 1 and 3 have been cracked, so they have nowhere near a majority. In this abstract example, regardless of the political parties, regardless of the candidates, regardless of voter turnout, regardless of the issues, the blues win two districts and the reds win one every time. Okay, so what? Why does this matter? What happens when electoral districts are gerrymandered? Well, gerrymandering can strengthen or weaken a particular party, depending on who's drawing the lines. This means that it can also provide an advantage or disadvantage for individual candidates, particularly an advantage to incumbents, people who have already won election and are running for re-election. When very elongated districts are drawn, representatives may live far away from some or many of their constituents. They may also come from different ethnic or economic backgrounds. And this can lead to detachment between the representative and their constituents. We already discussed the creation of minority majority districts, which can provide a greater voice to a particular ethnic minority by packing or stacking areas of minority voters into a single legislative district. Voters may also be less inclined to participate if they believe that their vote won't impact the outcome because it will be wasted or far exceed the amount needed to win the election. And then there are a number of state and federal Supreme Court cases in recent years that have challenged the quality or validity of electoral district lines. And we'll examine some of these tactics and effects when we come back to class. Have a good evening, everyone, and I'll see you later.